Turn this on. That's on. My name is Barbara Cottrell, and on behalf of the Seniors College of Nova Scotia, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming today, especially on this very rainy day. I think we're very lucky to be in this lovely hall, the Lillian Piercy Concert Hall which I'm told has some of the best acoustics in Halifax. I've been here many, many times, as I'm sure many of you have, for Cecilia concerts. And today we're going to find out about the people who, all this belongs to the Maritime Conservatory for the Performing Arts. Some years ago, or a couple of years ago, I met Simon Robinson, who was coming in as the director of the conservatory. And he told me that the conservatory was soon to be 135 years old. I was amazed. And then he was telling me about how Anna Plaskett was going to start a music therapy program here. And I realized there was a lot about this place that I didn't know. So I am very delighted today to have Simon and Anna joined by Sibylla Marquardt and they are going to talk about their work here in this building. Simon has, <clears throat> has a degree in fine arts. He is a painter and started a pirate museum in the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also worked for Oxford and Cambridge universities as director of one of their projects and is now the director of the Maritime Conservatory. Sibylla Marquardt is a flautist who has played with orchestras in Europe and in Canada and is now the Dean of Music here. Anna Plaskett comes from a very musical family. I've known Anna since she was a little girl and has been involved in music therapy for many years. And so I am thrilled to invite them to come today and tell us about the Maritime Conservatory. Thanks, Bob. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's on this sort of dark and rainy afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Bill Lee, Bob Russell, and John Stewart also. They've been working really hard to put this together, so my thanks to them. Location. Location. Who'd like to finish? <laughs> our presentation today is all about our location in Nova Scotia. This building and the extraordinary acti activities undertaken within, its charitable, within this charitable institution. First, I'd like to sincerely acknowledge that we are located in Kipuktuk in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. It is a beautiful territory indeed. It is a beautiful location. My thanks also go out to Dr. Garland Brooks, for his extensive research into the history of the conservatory. Much of what I have to say about the history of this place is borrowed from him. We will see that it was a long journey that brought the Maritime Conservatory of Performing Arts to this location. So let us begin. Almost exactly 135 years ago, it began as the Halifax Conservatory of Music, which opened in the, in the Uniaki Duffus Mansion in the south end of Halifax. Throughout the Maritimes, the conservatory quickly established a reputation for excellence, a reputation that has been sustained over the decades and continues to this day. After two years of the conservatory's opening, an agreement was reached with Dalhousie University, whereby Dalhousie would grant music degrees and licentiate diplomas for study at the conservatory. This arrangement lasted until 1962, when the university developed its own music program. Despite the loss of this partnership, the conservatory maintained its exceptional reputation and continued to attract such talented students as Denise Djokic, Sarah McLaughlin, and Ingrid Matheson. Dance instruction began at the conservatory in 8, 1947 with the Latvian ballet stars with the wonderful names of Irene Alpine and Juri Gottschalks. 
The instruction that they introduced became a key component of the conservatory's curriculum. And with the encouragement of Dance Nova Scotia, a teacher training program was established at the conservatory to improve the quality of dance instruction in the province. In recognition of the broadened curriculum, in 1998, the conservatory's name was changed to the Maritime Conservatory of the Performing Arts. Offering music and dance under one roof enhances the instruction of both and sets our conservatory apart. It is a unique place. It is a jewel which we must cherish. The definition of this word cherish is to protect or tend lovingly, to hold dear. We try to do this. But history has its ups and downs and the Great Depression of the 1930s forced a decline in the fortunes of the conservatory. In 1939, the then board took the difficult decision to sell the Barrington Street campus. For the next 60 years, the conservatory moved periodically in a perennial search for a new adequate lo location. A solution wasn't found until 1996, when the former Chibucto School became available. The conservatory acquired ownership of the, the historically and architecturally significant building on May the 1st, 2000. The building is a municipally, and we hope soon, a provincially and nationally recognized historic building. It was 1864 that the provincial government passed the Education Act, making it compulsory for all children aged eight to 14 to attend school. This act slowly put pressure on Nova Scotian communities to establish schools or to enlarge existing schools to accommodate more students. The Chibucto School was built between 1908 and 1910 to accommodate the increasing number of children living in the north end of Halifax. When it was constructed, the school was considered to be the largest and finest in the city. Today, if you climb up into the attic above us, as many have done over the years, you'll discover the signatures or initials of students and the date on which they made their ascent. These are written or sometimes carved into the wooden wooden roof supports. The earliest carved by MS is dated 1918. One year before MS carved their initials in our attic, in 1918, the French cargo ship SS Mont Blanc collided with the Norwegian vessel SS Emo in Halifax Harbor. The Mont Blanc, laden with high explosives, caught fire and a devastating explosion followed. 1,782 people were killed by the blast, flying debris, fires and collapsing buildings. A further estimated 9,000 were injured. The Chibucto School, being a large and relatively undamaged building, was used as a triage and first aid center. It was also used as a morgue for those who perished and later as a funeral home for those poor souls. During this time, the students were sent to other schools, but they would return when normality was resumed. As I have said, history has its ups and its downs. Architecturally, Chibucto School is celebrated as an excellent example of 20th century classic revival style, as embodied in the building's formal classical I-shaped configuration, its decorative brick pilasters, its variety of windows, the brick dental trim which outlines the corners. It was designed by Walter Bush, son of the famed local architect Henry Frederick Bush, who designed many Halifax schools and landmark buildings, including the Church of England Institute on Barrington Street. Walter Bush carried on his father's architectural practice and tradition of designing landmark buildings. He did so with great success, as we can see today. The wonderful concert hall that we are gathered in stands as the ultimate proof of the care and mastery of Walter Bush, his vision, design and construction. The hall was restored with the generous help of the Piercy family, a family that has a long and storied association with the conservatory. On the wall, at the back of the hall, you can see a photograph of Lillian Piercy. My predecessor, Ephraim Williams, has told me how she studied voice at the conservatory in the 1930s under his father, the then director, Ephraim Williams Sr. Lillian was well known for her talent. She was an esteemed member of Ephraim Sr.'s choir, the Halifax Choral Union. Her daughter, Sheila, also studied voice at the conservatory, this time with Theodore Brilts, whom Ephraim Sr. recruited. In Ifan's words, open quotes, the generosity of the Piercy family is founded in the very positive and fond memories of their association with the conservatory and the importance of its continuation and contribution to the education and cultural life in Nova Scotia, end quotes. 
The Piercy family have therefore been instrumental in ensuring that the conservatory is here today, offering the opportunity for all Haligonians to discover the magical benefits of a musical life. They have done this quietly and without fanfare. They've done it because they care. We don't say it enough, but I say thank you to the Piercys and like the legacy that they have passed on to the people of Halifax. Please join me as I finish my first presentation in appreciation of their generosity. At this point, I'd like to introduce Janet Bradbury, our wonderful Dean of Dance, but she is teaching today, so she's kindly given me her notes to read to you on her behalf. And this is about the School of Dance. With the arrival of, in 1947 of those Latvian ballet stars, Irene Alpine and Jury Gottschalks, a new chapter began at the conservatory. The Gottschalks offered high quality instruction in classical ballet and their classes quickly became popular. Although a few years later, they were invited by Celia Franca to join the fledgling National Ballet of Canada, the dance instruction the Gottschalks introduced had become a key component of the conservatory's curriculum. In 1950, ballroom dance was introduced by Gunter Buchter, who served as head of the School of Dance. Buchter was most known in Canada for the Buchter dancers who were regular performers on Don Messer's Jubilee from 1954 until 1971. Ballroom dance was a staple of conservatory activities until well into the 1990s. After a period of inactivity, ballroom dance has recently been revived under the guidance of Cole Richardson, this continues a long tradition, as Cole's teacher was Jane Edgett, who was in fact one of the Buchter dancers. The real growth of the School of Dance was under the direction of Barbara Dearborn, who took on the challenge of reviving the ballet program in 1985. Through her drive, determination and excellence in teaching, the program grew from just five students in 85 to over 300 by the time of her retirement in 2018. A professional ballet program was introduced that has produced dancers who have joined companies in both Canada and Europe, as well as a thriving recreational dance program, certificate programs and adult classes. The School of Dance has expanded beyond ballet and ballroom into modern, contemporary, jazz, tap and acrobatic dancing, as well as dance composition and theory. In 1983, with the encouragement of Dance Nova Scotia, a teacher training program was established at the conservatory to improve the quality of dance instruction in the province. To this day, many dance schools in Nova Scotia and indeed across Canada have been founded by conservatory trained dance teachers. In 2018, official private career college status was granted to the School of Dance teacher training program. Today, we boast a unique early childhood movement program, especially designed to meet the developmental needs of three to five-year-olds. As well, we are the only school in Atlantic Canada with a licensed Royal Academy of Dance Silver Swans instructor. Silver Swans is a program developed by the Royal Academy of Dance with all the joy, music and exercise of classical ballet, especially aged at the over 55 demographic. In fact, we have a class running just across the hall on Thursdays from two till three. We continue to look for new opportunities for expansion and collaboration. And that's from Janet. It's now my great pleasure to introduce a very special person. She's a very talented, accomplished flautist and teacher, and she also happens to be our Dean of Music. Please welcome Sibla Markar. Well, hello and welcome from the School of Music. Um, in our beautiful Lillian Piercy Hall that has heard and seen so many wonderful performances over the last few years that I've been in this uh, position honored to have the position of Dean of Music here. Um, as Dean, I look after the programming of the School of Music. And my main task is to keep the School of Music relevant and thriving throughout this 21st century. This is not a light task. And obviously I'm very blessed to have um, my dear colleague, Jenna Bradbury, the Dean of Dance with me to work towards this goal. Both of us love collaborating and we are aware that the combination of dance and music under one roof is unique 
and contributes to our strength and inspiration for creative programming. It is my pleasure today to tell you about the wonderful world of music we have here at the conservatory. I hope you'll excuse that I'm reading from my script, but with the amount of programs offered by the School of Music, I'm afraid I'll forget an important part of our music programming. So we are located right here in the heart of Halifax. And as a true not-for-profit organization, the School of Music is offering programs for the whole Halifax community, including all demographics and all ages. What we do, we do with love and with passion. We are inclusive and welcome all arts lovers with open arms. Our faculty counts 67 members. We offer lessons for all instruments and programs also cross over into contemporary commercial music as well as traditional Celtic music. The faculty of music is like a colorful mosaic of highly trained, interesting individuals dedicated to their students. It is a pleasure to organize, administrate, and work for this group of my wonderful colleagues and hearing of the achievements of stages far and wide. Our programming starts at age zero with kinder music, which was nominated one of the top kinder music programs in all of Canada, thanks to the amazing work of the head of department, Nicole Anaka. We actually just registered our 100th child into this fall's classes. Can you imagine a school of music without piano lessons? Our piano um, head of department is Dr. Cindy Thong, who started her own piano lessons in this building. There is only one word to describe this department and it is excellence. The steadily growing Suzuki program is an important component to educate young string players and our string programs are showing robust numbers. Susanna Brown, the head of the string department, is also the coordinator of our comprehensive orchestra program. The orchestra program is gently leading the budding musician from the first tentative steps in a string ensemble to achieving the refined cohesive string ensemble sound of our chamber orchestra. The Chamber Orchestra, under the direction of Celeste Jankowski, sets itself apart from the Nova Scotia Youth Orchestra by specializing on string instruments only and exploring repertoire written expressly for string orchestras through the centuries, bringing the students' attention to the fine points of interpretation of different musical styles in an authentic way and the particular tricks of the trade in bowing and tuning that contribute to the wonderfully cohesive string section sound we so admire in professional orchestras. For winds, brass, harp, and guitar, we offer various ensembles. The World Music Ensemble, under the direction of Daniel McNeil. Daniel McNeil also teaches oud here that is the guitar um, for Syrians, or the Syrian guitar, I should say. Whoops. Um, the brass ensemble is under the direction of Rod McGillivray. The fiddle and harp jam circle is led by Anna Wedlock and Ellen Gibling. And there's also an adult flute ensemble co-directed by Jennifer Publikover and myself. This department is led by head of department, Matthew Richard. Then we get to our voice department with department head Patrick Maubert. It is recovering from the impacts of COVID as is our winds and brass department. We have 11 voice faculty members, some of which have international career backgrounds and come from university positions. The steadily increasing following of the musical theater intensive we offer is showing also a very promising trend indeed. 
The conservatory is very happy to have the Seton Conservatory Choir with us. Did you know that? Yes. Um, this is a long-standing audition for voice choir under the direction of Garth McPhee. We just put together the poster for their next concert at the end of November with the poetic title, Wintertide Awakes, Music to Light the Snowy Path. I certainly won't miss that one. Music theory is an essential part of music education. Questions like, how do I count the beats and fit the rhythms of a melody into a time signature? What does a 30 second note rest looks like? Or what key is this piece in? Or what on earth is a diminished seventh chord? So all this is explained in music theory classes. In ancient Greece, music theory was also part of the sciences. And we are proud to offer classes up to the very top of the requirements of the Royal Conservatory of Music's theory syllabus and beyond. Our head of department is Dr. Lorna Wanzel. Obviously standing in this wonderful hall, performances and recitals are abundant in our school and our students can choose from a wide variety of opportunities. Our faculty members organize class recitals and love to take their students outside the conservatory to perform at, for example, the Central Library, Northwood Care, or for other community events. Faculty members also choose students to perform in our general recitals, which showcase our student body to the public on three weekends during the school year. There's an adult, a junior, as well as a senior recital on each of these weekends. Some of the most memorable moments of my job have been hosting recitals and concerts. Hearing the level of playing and the quality of instruction in our students' performances has often moved me to tears. The conservatory also has many donors and sponsors that give us funds for scholarships and awards. I'm going to tell you about the inner workings of our awards. A small panel of judges sits inconspicuously in the audience during all general recitals and makes notes. This panel then meets at the end of the school year and decides on awards for our non-audition scholarships. We also have audition scholarships, which are judged by an independent panel of judges from outside the conservatory. And that is during auditions as the title suggests. Um, all awards are formally handed out during our convocation in June. And if you haven't been present at one, do come and join us celebrating our students' achievements and hearing some of their prowess in performances throughout the ceremony. We also offer examinations of levels one through eight in-house for our community and for students from the whole Halifax area, um, as well as adult assessments, which is a new assessment type. Adult candidates can register for an assessment of their playing from one of our specialist faculty members without having to undergo the strain of a formal examination with the technical and oral requirements necessary. The assessments are more informal and candidates can either ask for verbal or written report or simply chat with the examiner. Most of these programs have existed for 135 years, as we heard, in various forms, and we are molding them to stay relevant. I now will take some time to get to the newly created programs. I had warned you that this is going to be a long list. Outreach is a very important pillar of many not-for-profit organizations, and we are no exception. To expand our outreach programming, we have partnered with St. George YouthNet and offer a year-round after-school program on Friday afternoons teaching children singing, as well as string and brass instruments in these weekly one hour sessions. This will be our second year of this collaboration. 
the Family Discovery Concert Series, is returning this school year with two free concerts for all ages. Performances are by our Faculty of Music and Dance. The concerts are all in this hall and showcase the many talents of our faculty. You might want to mark your calendars for November 6 and hear about the history of the trumpet and see a thrilling dance performance. The conservatory has joined forces with the Nova Scotia Registered Music Teachers Association for this year's Canada Music Week. As the Center for the Contemporary Showcase Festival in the Maritimes, we are the East Coast branch of this national organization created by the Alliance for Canadian New Music Projects. This is a festival solely dedicated to music written by Canadian composers. This year's adjudicators are pianist Todd Yanu, who is going to come in from Toronto and is a teacher at the Royal Conservatory Toronto, as well as Scott McMillan, who is going to be our specialist and adjudicator for the new Canadian Celtic section of the festival. With so many new programs and performances and recitals and events, we are a truly busy school. All of us here know the value of music and its many benefits for the development of the brain, for mental fitness and prevention of dementia and Alzheimer's. Science offers much proof today. From improved memory function to the joy, pleasure and the immersion into a flow activity that makes us be in the moment, singing or playing an instrument connect us and opens pathways. But music is also healing. Music is soothing. And music is a recognized therapeutic tool. Last but not least, I will now segue to our newest branch of the School of Music, Music Therapy. Creating the Center for Music Therapy at the Maritime Conservatory has been a thoroughly meaningful journey for me. It is with great pleasure that I will give the microphone to Anna Plaskett, the head of department music therapy and former owner of HeartSparks Music Therapy. Anna joined the conservatory with her team of certified music therapists, and we are thrilled, thrilled to have her with us. Without further ado, over to you. Thank you, Sibylla and Simon. Um, I'm thrilled for the opportunity to bring music therapy to the Maritime Conservatory. And I have certainly appreciated both of your enthusiasm and support throughout this process. Um, I spent a lot of time in this building as a child and teenager back when it belonged to the Halifax City Schools Music Department. Um, so it kind of feels like a full circle to be coming back here. Um, I thought before I share a little bit about music therapy that we could start with a song. <laughs> So this is a, an, a your, uh, this song requires your active participation. You've been sitting <coughs> sitting for a while. So this is a stretching song. <laughs> In a room full of seniors, so we're going to touch our toes or go as close as you can go. You can reach for your toes. <laughs> we'll see who's been doing their yoga or their silver swans dancing. Touch our toes or as close as you can go. 
stretch or if you want to do your neck whatever feels good stretch our bodies yeah and you can stand up too if you want <laughs> stretch our I feel more relaxed. I hope you do too. I always like to start with music because it helps me feel a little bit more relaxed, more comfortable with that than talking. <laughs> um, so I have a few questions for you all. Um, you can just give a show of hands. I'm wondering if any of you listen to music on your way here today. A couple, that's good. It's good you're listening to music rather than the news these days. Um, how about, um, Anybody who sings or plays music with their family? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> How about enjoys attending musical concerts? Beautiful. What about singing in the shower? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> um, How about listening to music to relax? Um, what about to get energized, to get moving? Yeah, we just did that. Um, and how about to take your mind off your worries? <laughs> Beautiful. Well, I think I, it's always my biggest fear when I ask these questions that, you know, nobody raises their hand on one of them. But I think I, you know, everyone raised their hand on something. Um, I always like to start with these questions just to remind you of some of the different and simple ways that music impacts our everyday lives. Because whether someone listens to recorded music, sings in the shower, or plays an instrument, either amateurly or professionally, everyone is moved by the power of music in some way. And I find it's often difficult to put into words what music does. And uh, I've thought about this a lot, but I think it's because so much of music is nonverbal. Um, we know that there's a feeling about music, something that seems to take over and make us feel things that weren't there before, um, move our bodies in new ways, um, or heighten or resonate with our present feelings. Um, music is unique in this way. It really is its own language that allows people to communicate, feel, and experience together on an equal level without using words. And at the core of music therapy practice, lies the belief that everyone has the potential to respond to music and sound. And music therapists work towards people, helping people of all levels and ability to experience the power of making and responding to music to tap into the wellness that exists within themselves. Um, despite outer appearances, um, I, I live to believe that everyone has the capacity to access a well place inside of themselves. And music can often be the ticket to, to helping people access that well place. 
Um, music therapy is a combination of using the music itself with the relationship that is formed between the participant and the therapist through the music that work to, together to bring about wellness. I often call music my co-therapist because the music itself has so many amazing elements built into it. Into it. it gives me just so much to play with. Music can provide both structure and groundedness and safety, um, but it can also provide flexibility and energy and freedom, which is often exactly what you need um, to connect with people, um, especially people who might have difficulty expressing themselves verbally. When making music in a music therapy session, it's the process of music making rather than the product. Sorry about that big P. Um, uh, yes, the process rather than the product that matters. So to give you an example of working with a, a child, for example, um, I'm thinking of a child, a nonverbal child with cerebral palsy, um, which is a disability that affects movement. So one of the things that I might do with them is uh, let them strum my guitar while I'm forming the chords. And it might take them a little extra time and motor planning, you know, to get their arm to the guitar. Um, so I will wait and adapt my chord changes and singing to meet their tempo. Um, and while the sounds we make together might not, not be, you know, totally in a steady rhythm um, or sound like perhaps some of the typical very high quality music you'll hear coming from the halls of the conservatory. Um, this doesn't matter. What matters is the way that it makes the child feel. Um, hopefully it makes them feel able. They're moving their body. Um, they're getting feedback, you know, creating a sound. Um, uh, and that's powerful. And hopefully they feel heard. Um, since I'm responding and adapting my singing to meet them where they are. Um, it gives them a way to contribute to the music and to communicate and then interact with another person without using words. Um, and also to be a part of making beauty. Um, what's more beautiful than a positive give and take in the moment between two people? Um, another example from the other end of the age spectrum um, is an elderly woman. I'll call her Helen today. Um, I met Helen during my music therapy internship um, many years ago at a long-term care facility in Kenville. And Helen was a single woman throughout her life. She didn't have any children um, and didn't have any family who visited her in the in the care facility. Um, but I was told that she had spent her life as a music teacher. Um, so I knew, you know, she she loved music. Um, and Helen lived with Alzheimer's. And at the point that I had met her, um, she had no short term memory. Um, so even though I worked with her several times a week for for many years, um, she never learned my name or knew kind of why I was there. She just kind of, I think, because I had the guitar, she knew she, that she, I was safe, I guess. Um, and when we spoke, her words were often jumbled and didn't make a lot of sense. Um, but as soon as I started to sing old familiar songs, the, the song she loved was In the Garden, the, the hymn, um, but she knew so many songs. Um, she was just right there with me in the music, and she was able to sing the words clearly. Um, you know, at the time, like I was just getting out of my training, and it just blew my mind that here we are, we're, you know. Um, and one day when we were singing You Are My Sunshine together, I came to the verse that uh, that says, I'll always love I can't, uh, and make you happy if you will only love me too. And Helen shouted out with enthusiasm, I love you, you know? And, and so of course I said back, I love you too, you know? And I never forgot that moment. It was just so simple and joyous. Um, and it speaks so well to the fact that despite the various debilitating conditions that 
so many people live with, you know, Alzheimer's is one of them, that music can be such a wonderful tool in helping someone to access that place of wellness that exists within themselves. Some might call it their spirit or their spark. Um, yeah, so that's kind of my personal way of describing music therapy. Um, the official definition of music therapy, according to our national association, the Canadian Association of Music Therapists, is that music therapy is a discipline in which credentialed professionals use music purposefully, there's that P again, <laughs> within therapeutic relationships to support development, health, and well being. Music therapists use music safely and ethically to address human needs within cognitive, communicative, emotional, physical, social, and spiritual domains. So if you're looking for a music therapist, you want to look for someone with an MTA next to their name. That means music therapist accredited. And that means that somebody, that person has gone, gone and completed a training um, music therapy education and completed a certification process. Um, because we know the power of music, it, it, it's powerful, so it does need to be used safely. Um, our music therapy program at the conservatory will be serving individuals of all ages and levels of ability, including those with physical and developmental disabilities, autism, neurodiversity, brain injury, neurological disorders, mental health challenges, Alzheimer's and dementia, and more. The conservatory music therapy program's mission is to provide access to the healthy and joyful outcomes of a musical life. Our current team of nine certified music therapists and three music therapy interns are providing sessions both on site at the conservatory in our newly renovated room across the hall, um, as well as in the community. And the therapists travel to individuals' homes, as well as to various facilities, anywhere from preschools to school learning centers to residential facilities for youth to small options homes for intellectually disabled adults and to long-term care facilities. Um, they offer both individual and group music therapy sessions, as well as what we call adaptive lessons. Um, and I think this is something that Sibylla was kind of most excited about um, bringing into the conservatory. Um, adaptive lessons are a combination of fundamental music learning and therapeutic based goals. So the lessons are tailored to the strengths, learning style and unique needs of the individual. Um, and some adaptations um, can include a specialized music notation, uh, modified instrument tunings, um, physical adaptation of instruments. So maybe like um, uh, one of our therapists, Brandon, he's teaching bass to someone who's got some mobility issues and, and he, places the bass on, on his lap and, and tunes it, I think, to an open tuning. So he's able to have a successful experience. Um, the use of uh, client preferred music and attention to the sensory environment of the lesson space. Um, yeah, I, I didn't plan on saying this, but it just comes to mind as I'm talking about the adaptive lessons that my very first job at the at the long term care facility in Kenville, I, I met so many folks who told me I, I took music lessons as a child, and I was told I wasn't musical. And it always made me so sad, you know, um, it was, you know, maybe that very old school um, lesson, you know, the lesson has to be just like this. So I think, you know, uh, being willing to try a different kind of music, if that's the music that the child enjoys is a way to motivate them and really kind of spark that joy and love of music um, and help them to succeed. Um, we've also recently initiated a few groups on site at the conservatory, and one of them is for seniors. Um, it's called Seniors in Song. And this group is facilitated by Paige Morrissey. Um, Paige is a, a beautiful singer and she also plays the guitar and the harp. Um, this group's happening on Wednesday mornings. Um, it's uh, 
with the help of the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia. It's a free group offering. Um, and I believe there may be two spots available left in the group, if, if anyone's inspired after today. Um, and actually Paige is going to be running the same group um, starting next week at a community center um, uh, next to Northwood Bedford. I think it's called the Northwood Community Center. Um, so that's in Bedford. And this is also, it's a free program and it's also through um, sponsored by the Mental Health Foundation. Um, so if you have any questions about those groups, you could, uh, the, the folks at the front desk could, could tell you the dates and time and everything. Um, so yeah, that's my little blurb on music therapy. Uh, I must say a huge thank you to Sibylla for spearheading getting this program going. Um, when I met her, I think it was about a year and a half now, feels like longer really. Um, it wasn't with the intention of transferring my whole independent practice because I've been working for 18 years and developed my own um, music therapy business. But I, so I wasn't planning on doing that, but after seeing the space and hearing her enthusiasm and vision for the future of the conservatory, um, it really felt like the right fit and that it's, you know, worth taking a chance on. Um, so I'm super excited to see how having this program will impact the overall spirit of inclusion and diversity within the organization. Um, so yeah, I started with a song and I think I'll end with a song too. <laughs> You're not off the hook yet for moving your bodies. <laughs> Um, so this is a this is a song that I I made up one day when I was with a group of children. Now it's uh, but I think it's kind of fun for adults too. Um, I call it my body drumming song, and um, the context is I was in a preschool classroom and I was losing the kids. They were you know they were kind of climbing the walls, and I, I I knew I need to bring them in, and I need to bring them into their bodies. So I said. Um, can we turn our bodies into drums? So can you guys turn your bodies into drums? We're gonna tap our heads. Can you tap your head? <laughs> and our shoulders. And how about our chest? And when we do our chest, this is the time to get any, any pent up energy that's you know arisen during this presentation. Can you go, ah! <laughs> And then how about our bellies? <laughs> and our legs. And then when we go down to our feet, you can stomp your feet along the floor and we'll maybe go a little bit faster. All right, so you got the idea of it. Now I'm gonna, we'll, we'll do it with my guitar. So we'll start at our heads. We're gonna drum our heads. <laughs> the oh, oh if you like and we'll go to our cheeks drum my cheeks drum my cheeks drum our cheeks so oh. and our shoulders we're waking up our body Shout out! <laughs> Show me your energy! <laughs> Thank you. 
again. How will this do our arms? Wake up our arms. drumsticks into kind of like, uh, I don't know, those things that like massage your head. You can give your head a little, a little head massage. <laughs> Imagine it. Close our eyes and rub our head. Close our eyes and rub our head. One more time on that. Close our eyes. if I give you messy hair at the end, but <laughs> yeah. And then let's all take a deep breath in and out. I knew that Anna would steal the show, honestly. <laughs> um, to wrap up, we've heard today how the Maritime Conservatory has been evolving for 135 years. Throughout that time, thousands of students have developed a lifelong love of the performing arts, many of whom have gone on to professional careers all around the world, based on the solid foundation acquired here in this location. Anna Plaskett reminded me that for a time, the conservative building was also the home of the Halifax City Schools Music Department. And she said a lot of musical memories for folks in Halifax when it belonged to the school system. Anna remembers a giant ukulele in the front hallway that spanned from the entry to the second level. So ours is a history and a legacy that we all should be very proud of. And don't forget, it's a non-profit, a charitable, charitable institution invested in the performing arts. It is that jewel to be cherished. As a celebrated author, Anna Sewell wrote in her novel of 1877, Black Beauty, it is good people who make good places. Today, students of all ages and abilities continue to join our arts family at the conservatory. They're supported in a safe environment to pursue their goals and follow their dreams in music and dance. From the youngest toddler in our kinder music program to the silver swans of ballet, we continue to nurture Haligonians in the performing arts in all ages and stages of life. Music and dance nourish the, nourish the soul. Learning and performing builds confidence, enhances lives, and helps people become their true selves. Drawn here by our reputation for excellence, the Conservatory has a faculty of experienced and professional teachers who are at its heart and, heart and soul. You could say orchestras are born here, that ballet troops are born here. There can be no orchestras or ballet if there are no musicians or dancers to perform, perform in them. We believe in the Conservatory and the valuable work that it shelters. It's a home of human beauty. But our home needs help, your help. I'd like you to consider today making a financial gift to support our operation. Without the operation, that is everything that supports our faculty and keeps the doors open. Without that, there would be no music, no dance, no scholarships, no bursaries. We'll be embarking on a capital campaign to restore this historic building and to refit and upgrade the interior. This will include soundproofing and other upgrades to truly make this wonderful building the perfect home for us. We also hope to create an endowment so that we can maintain the building for future generations. We believe there can be no greater legacy than to offer the precious gift of music and dance for our children and for our children's children. Please join our family, do it today. 
We have pledged contact sheets on the table at the rear of the hall. Fill in your name and number and I will be in touch with you to chat about what kind of gift you'd like to consider. Every little bit helps, or indeed perhaps you'd like to volunteer. I thank you in advance for your generosity. I thank you for giving the gift of music and dance for the people of today and the people of tomorrow. I thank you for keeping music and dance alive in this location. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much for that presentation. I've learned a tremendous amount today and got very enthusiastic. So thank you from my heart to all three of you. It was wonderful. Um, yeah. I also would like to thank our tech guys who have been recording this session so that they can put it on YouTube, I think, right? Um, Bob Russell, Bill Lee, John Stewart, and John uh, Stewart Cameron is somewhere. So thank you, thank you all very much for your wonderful hard work. I'd also like to give a plug for SCANS. The Seniors College of Nova Scotia is always really desperate for volunteers to come and help out with the work. And the work is fun things like organizing these lectures. So if anybody has any spare time and would like to get involved, you don't have to have much skill, believe me. <laughs> um, the next lecture we're going to do is on November the 7th at 2 p.m. And um, oof, Honorable Mary Ann Francis is going to talk about her relationship with the whole um, Viola Desmond issue. Um, when she was Lieutenant Governor, um, Mayan sought the pardon for Viola Desmond and in doing so got to know her sister and so learned a lot about Viola Desmond as a person. And she was talking to me about how what we don't think about quite often is the struggle that some of these icons go through and what it costs them to do what they did. And so she's going to talk about a much more personal, I think, um, history of Viola Desmond. And that's November the 7th, 2 p.m. And that is on Zoom. Um, now, we'd like to have some time for um, question and answers, but the music uh, group need the room next door at four o'clock, which we want to have tea and coffee in there. So what we'd like to do is to ask everybody to go next door, have a cup of coffee or, or a cup of tea, and maybe ask your questions to our three guests and they will perhaps be able to answer for you there. So we'll do it much more informally. So again, my, my great thanks to you all for coming. We really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you.